Okay, so this week we are going to be doing linear regression. So that's me. Most of you know me by now. And tonight we are going to learn about regression lines. We will study the assumptions and we will le learn more about regression parameters. So what's simple linear regression? It's a statistical method that allows us to summarize and study relationships between two continuous variables by using a line drawn through those variables' data points. So the regression line is the line that best fits the data. So when you have a set of data, you have some x values and you have some y values, and you plot them, if you just plot the points, you get what we call a scatter plot with just the points. But sometimes having just the points is not really helpful. We want to make predictions. We want to see what value we'll get. If we have an x value, we want to say, what would be the y value if I had an x value, which was, say, some number like uh, 2000 in this example. So in this example, we are plotting in x-axis, we are plotting uh, the square footage for home, and the y-axis gives the price. So just having sets of points may not be very helpful. So what we do is we find a line that best fits the points. Because it's not possible to find a line that will go through all the points. That would be an ideal situation. but you, if you can find a line that best fits your data, that goes through at least some of the points or touches upon some of the points, we call that a regression line. And a regression line is very useful in making predictions. For example, the sales. If I spend this much, what would be the sales of my company? So looking at some sets of set of data from the past, if you can have a graph and if you can draw a regression line, you can make predictions for the future. Okay, I forgot to mention that whatever you plot along the x-axis, that's your predictor variable. And along the y-axis, the variable is called response variable. It's called this way because the y is dependent on the x. So the cost of the home will depend on the square footage. So x is the predictable and y is the response variable. The equation for a simple linear regression line. The population simple linear regression function is e of y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x, where beta 0 and beta 1 are regression parameters. e of y is the expected value of y. Expected value is the value that you get from the line. When you make some calculations, you plug in the x value and you get the y. That's called the expected value. A particular data point has an actual value for y. This point could lie above or below the regression line. So if you look at the graph here, my data points are the dots, the blue dots, and my regression line is the red line. The actual value is the observed value, the value that you actually observe when you do the experiment, when you conduct the survey. Those are the blue points. Those are the points that you get from the survey. The lines, the line red line is a regression line, and all the points on the red line are your expected values for y. So if you take a certain value for x, you will have one value which will be on the regression line that's called the expected value. So in an ideal situation, this is what you would expect based on the line. But what you actually observe in real life could be different, and that's your actual value, which is the blue dot. And you see, there's a difference between the two because they're not the same. One is lying lower than the other. So the difference between these two points, the distance between these two points, we call that the regression error. And that's given by this symbol. We call that epsilon. So for each actual data point y, a positive or negative value can be added to the expected value e of y 
to achieve y. So no matter which point you take, there will be an expected value on the line. And you might have a corresponding observed value. Sometimes this point will lie below the expected value and sometimes it might lie above the line. So this regression error will be positive, negative, or zero, depending on where your actual point is. Yes, and all of this is in linear regression. In linear regression, you will have some set of points from your survey, from the experiment that you do. The line will summarize all these points. The points on the line are your expected values. And what you actually observe could be the same, or in most cases, it will be slightly different. So the regression error will be positive for the points that lie above the regression line because you're trying to find the difference between the two. You're trying to find the distance. And for points that lie lower, it's going to be negative. And if your actual value lies on the line itself, then there is no error. So then it will be zero. Okay, so we looked at the equation for the line. The equation for the line is e of y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x. So how will you find beta 0 and beta 1? So the next part, I will tell you the two ways that Zybox talks about. And we'll talk about both the ways on finding beta 0 and beta 1. So the first one is to minimize the absolute error. So here I have a graph with some x and y values. So my points, the orange points that I have, are the actual values that we have observed. So those points are here in the table. So then I, I draw a line. And what I do is I find the distance between the line and the actual data points. So those are the red lines. And that's going to be the regression error. So for each of the points, I will find the regression error. And that's what I have in the third column. So you see some values are negative, some are positive. This method where we say, we call it the minimizing, we call it minimizing the absolute errors. What this method does is you take all the errors and then you neglect the negative sign and just add up just the numbers. When you are not looking at the negative sign, you're looking at the absolute value of a number. So the absolute value of negative 2 would be just 2. Absolute value of negative 8 is 8. So you take the absolute value and add up all the regression errors. So that's called the sum of absolute errors. So we get a number. In this case, it's 20. Our idea here is to find a line where when you add up all the absolute errors, the value that you get is minimum. So in this case, it is 20. But let's say I draw a different line. So in my second graph, I have a different line where the slope is different from the previous one. So in this case, again, we find the regression errors. And then you take the absolute values, add them up, and the total here comes up to 14. So here, my sum of absolute errors is less than the previous one for the same set of points. Because here, my line is different. I've drawn a different line. The slope, if you want to find the slope, it's the change in y over the change in x. So we will come to that point when you're talking about the parameters. I will tell you what the slope is and how you can mathematically find the slope. So the line we are drawing, it's just some random line we are drawing. We are hoping we will find a line where the sum of absolute errors is minimum. 
So you are talking about drawing many, many, many lines. But each of the lines, finding the absolute errors, adding them up, finding the one where the sum of errors is the minimum. So that's going to take, it's going to be a tedious process. But that's, that's the idea behind finding a regression line, is you find a line where the sum of absolute errors is minimum. The reason we do that is we have found that when you do that, the line that we get, that's the line that best fits the data. That's the line that will be the regression line. Yes, Python can do that. We will be looking at that in just a little bit, how we can find the regression line using Python. So this is one method that we have looked at. The next method is to minimize the sum of squared errors. So this is similar to the previous method, except we take it one step forward. We square the errors. So the sum of squared errors is the sum of the squared differences between y values of the data points and the values obtained from the regression line. What this means is you find the error and you square it. So given the data points below, compute the sum of squared errors for the regression equation y equals 7 plus 2x. So these are my data points. And those are the points that are marked in red in the graph. And then I have a line y equals 7 plus 2x. And let's say this is the line that I have drawn. The equation of the line is 7 plus 2x. I want to find the sum of squared errors. So based on this equation y equals 7 plus 2x, I have some data points x and y. You mean the square root? I didn't get your question, Jay. So you're saying you have to find the square root? Is it the previous one? Yeah, that's the sum of absolute errors. If you took the square, yes, you're right. Because I'm squaring it up, and then if I take the square uh, square root, I will end up with that, yes. Yes, it is. It's a different way of getting rid of negatives. And also, I think it helps when you scale it scale it up by squaring it because when you're talking about absolute um, errors and the sum of absolute errors sometimes you might have really small values but when you square it it scales it up and probably makes it more um, easier for further calculations but it's basically doing the same thing taking the error and squaring it so okay so for the equation y equals 7 plus 2x, I have some points. For the same x value, 0, 3, 7, and 10, I find my y values. So I plug in x to be 0, 3, 7, and 10, and I get the corresponding y values. Those are the values that are marked in blue in the graph. So those are the expected values. Yes, talking about 7 would be beta 0 and um, 2 would be beta 1, not 2x. 2 would be beta 1. But what happens is when you talk about the population, that's when we say beta 0 and beta 1. When we are talking about a sample where you have lesser values than your population, then your beta 0 gets replaced by a small letter b, b0, and beta 1 gets replaced by small letter b1. We will come to that in a little bit. 
So here in the table, I have the x values and then the y values and then the expected y values from the equation and then you find the errors and then you square the errors. So the sum of the squared errors here is 120. So now imagine drawing different lines that seem to fit the data and doing the above calculations to find the line where the sum of squared errors is least. So you're looking at a very tedious process. Which one? The 7, 13, 21, and 27. I plugged in the values for x. So my equation was 7 plus 2x. So for x equals 0, for the first one, x would be 0. So my y value would be 7. For the second one, x is 3. So you plug in x equals 3, and then you get your y. I think we would eliminate the um, outliers, but I'm not completely sure. Because it's hard to find a line that would kind of represent all the values in your data set. So what we can do is find one that approximately represents your data set. Yes, I'm given the x values from, um, the x is the predictor. You, if you recollect, x values are the predictor values, so those values you will know. y values are the ones that are the response values, because those are the values you would not know in your experiment when you're doing it. Those are the values that will come up when you're running the experiment. For the expected values for y, you will plug in the same values for x, the predictor values. So the y values 5, 5, 27, and 31, those are the observed values. So just imagine an experiment or a survey where you have come up with y equals 5, 5, 27, and 31. The actual data points, yes. No, the predictor is always along the x-axis. The y is what we plot. The unknown variable is always plotted along the y. And it's also called the dependent variable because y depends upon x. So let's look at Python code to find the regression line. So here we import numpy as np. The numpy is um, a library that you have to import. Then we import skypy.stats as st. Then we have two arrays, the x values and then the y values. So we do x equals np.array, y equals np.array. We give the points and then we do print st.linregress. That takes on two values or the two arrays, x and y. And your output is the slope and then the intercept, and then you have a bunch of other values. But for now, we are interested in the slope and the inter intercept. The slope is your B1. So here, if you see, here, this is where I was talking about beta 0 being replaced by B0. So the, for the sample, the sample simple linear regression function is given by y hat equals B0 plus B1x. So B0 and B1, they are parameters which are ex estimating the values for beta 0 and beta 1. It's hard to find beta 0 and beta 1, but it's easier to find B0 and B1 because you will have a sample that you can run the study on. Once we have B0 and B1, we can just hope that this best estimates the value of, of beta 0 and beta 1. So. When you talk about the sample, we do, instead of y, we say y hat. 
and here B0 is 2, B0 is the intercept. So that's 2. When I talk about the intercept, that's the point where my regression line meets the y-axis. So I can go back and show you. So here if you see the point where my regression line meets the y-axis, that is my intercept value. So that's the distance from 0 up to that point. So that's my intercept. The slope is the change in y or the change in x. So if you take any two values on, these, on this line, any two values for y, subtract it, divide that by the difference in the x values, the corresponding x values, then you get the slope. There is another image that will come later in the slides. I'll show you how you can get the slope. So the intercept is 2, the slope is 3. So now my sample simple linear regression function y hat is 2 plus 3x. So you see the line that we had earlier was 7 plus 2x. But according to Python, this is the line that best fits the data, 2 plus 3x. So now, based on this y, uh, expected y that we have, y hat equals 2 plus 3x, based on this equation, the question is, what is the fitted value when x equals 0? So now you have to plug in x equals 0, and we get the expected value to be 2. So this is the fitted value. Fitted value is nothing but the expected value. So based off of your equation, we are getting 2. But uh, from our experiment, you see the table, we got a 5. So now the next step would be to find the error. What is the corresponding re regression residual? Regression residual is nothing but the regression error. So that is epsilon equals 5 minus 2, that is 3. Any questions? Fitted value is the value that you get from your equation. So when you have your regression line, the line will have an equation, right? In this case, we found that y hat was equals 2 plus 3x. So that's my equation for the regression line. Fitted value is the y value that you get when you plug in some value for x. So in this case, if I take x from my table, if I take x equals 0 and I plug it in, my value of y comes out to be 2. That is my fitted value or the expected value from the line. But what you actually observe would be different from your expected value. Yes, from the actual to the predicted, that's correct. Okay, the simple linear regression assumptions. So the simple linear regression model assumes that at each value of the predictor x, the probability distribution of the regression error epsilon, which is y minus e of y, equals y minus beta 0 plus beta 1 of x, has a mean of 0, has a constant va variance, is normal, and the value of epsilon for one observation is independent of the value of epsilon for another observation. So what we are talking about now is the residual, or the regression error. So from our previous, if you remember, the first formula that we look at, looked at was E of y equals um, y sorry, beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus epsilon. So we've just rearranged that equation. So I have y minus beta 0 plus beta 1 of x, where beta 0 plus beta 1 of x is nothing but the expected value from my equation. So I'm doing observed value minus expected value. 
So that's my residual. That's the regression error. And we assume that this regression error that we get has a mean of zero, has constant variance, is normal, and one value is independent of the other. So since the population regression errors are not observable, so we will use the sample residuals. So it would be E of i equals y of i minus y hat of i. i here could be any number. If it is the first value that I'm looking at in my data set, then i will be, let's say, 1. If it's a second value, i will be 2. If it's a third value, i would be 3 and so on. So for any value, we just say epsilon of i equals y i minus y hat of i. So for any point in my graph, my residual or my error is the observed value minus the expected value. This equation. So if you remember, the regression error is the difference between the actual data point and the point on the regression line. Right, so it is so my actual data point, if I represent that as y, the point on my line is represented as beta 0 plus beta 1 of x. So all I'm doing is, doing, is taking the observed value and subtracting the expected value. y hat, yes. y hat is the expected value when you're talking about samples and not the population. For population, you just say y. For a sample, you say y hat. So I can go back and show you that formula that we had in the beginning. Yeah, this one. y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus epsilon. Right? If I were to rearrange this equation, and I want to find epsilon, so then it would be y minus beta 0 plus beta 1 of x. So the minus, there should have been a parenthesis in my equation. So it should have been y minus beta 0 plus beta 1 of x in parenthesis. This equation is for the points. This is called, it's called the regression function. So when you talk about the regression function, it's actually the equation for the regression line. When you talk about the model, sometimes you, you see the word they, they would use model. They would say the regression model is this. When you talk about the regression model, then you would have beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus epsilon. But when you talk about the function or the equation, then it is beta 0 plus beta 1 x. Because for the line, the equation is representing the line. It, it has nothing to do with the errors. So if I have to ask you what is the regression line, you would just say beta 0 plus beta 1 x. But if we are talking about the regression model, then we want to include the errors as well. Then we would say beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus epsilon. B0, B1, they are the parameters on the line. So the moment I say beta 0 plus beta 1 x, I'm referring to the line. Uh, you mean the regression error? That can be negative. We say plus epsilon. Epsilon value can be negative or positive. But when we write it, we just say plus epsilon. So the mean of zero assumption. So here we are talking about the regression errors. When you're talking about um, a sample, we call it residuals. So if the mean is approximately 0 all the way across the plot, then the mean of 0 assumption holds. 
So what we are doing is calculating all the residuals and plotting it against the predictor variable x. And if you look at the first plot, it has points all over the plot. So when you look at it from left to right, there is no fixed pattern. There is no pattern that you can observe. It's just a random set of points. But if you look at the second plot, there is a definite pattern. So for lower values of x, the residual value is more, and then it drops, and then it rises again as x values increase. So there's a pattern here. So in this case, the assumption that the mean is 0 does not hold. But for the first one, the assumption will hold. Whenever you do a study, you want to make sure all your assumptions hold good. And the first one is seeing whether the mean is 0. The next assumption is constant variance. Again, we plot the residuals versus the predictor variable x. In the first plot, if you see, it's just random. There is no particular pattern. But in the second one, if you see, the residual values are closer to 0 for lower values of x. And as x values increase, your residual values increase. So here, in the second plot, the assumption does not hold good. For the first one, the constant variance assumption holds good. For the normality assumption, I want to tell you how we can create a quantile quantile plot. This is not given in Zy books, but they just give you a graph. If I go one step ahead and show you, they will give you this. They'll say the sample quantile versus the theoretical quantiles, it should be a diagonal line with all the points along the line. So I just want to explain what are these quantiles and how do we get them. So let's assume we have nine values from a sample. So my n is nine, my sample size is nine. So these are the values. Then we draw a standard normal curve and divide it into n plus one segments. In our example, we divide it into nine plus one, 10 segments. So you draw a curve and all the red lines are dividing my entire curve into 10 segments. And the area under the curve for each of the segments is the same. So each segment is 10% of the total area. Then we find the z-value or the cutoff points for each segment. So what we do is I have my curve and I have divided into 10 segments. So for each of the lines, I will find the corresponding z values. So for the first line on my left, the z value is negative 1.28. So I have not marked all the points. So there is one where I have negative 0 0.52, and then I have positive 0 0.52 and 1.28. You would have to do this for every uh, line in the curve. So finding the corresponding z values. And then what you're going to do is plot the data set values to the cutoff points. So when you draw the curve and then you divide it into 10 segments, so the point here on the x-axis, whatever is your value of x there, you're going to find the corresponding z value. When you divide your curve into 10 segments, this is a standard normal curve, so the mean is 0. And when you divide it, the z value here will be negative 1.28. If you were to mark all the z values along the x-axis for this curve, this line will lie at negative 1.28.
So imagine the horizontal x-axis to have all the z-values with the center as 0 and extending up to 3 on the right and three, negative 3 on the left. So for each of these lines, the point along the x-axis would be negative 1.28 for the first one. And then similarly, you would mark for all the lines. Yes, for a standard normal curve, yes. The next step is to plot your actual data points to these values, to these z values. So what we do is we take negative 1.28 and map it to 3.77. So that would be the first point. So we have the theoretical quantiles or the z scores along the x-axis. Then we plot the actual quantiles or the values from my sample data. So in my sample data, my first value was 3.7. So I plot that against negative 1.28, and that's the first point in my graph. The second point, I don't have the exact values, but here for the third one, I have negative 0 0.52 and 4.5. So that would be the third point. So you would do that for all the nine points in your data set. And this is called the quantile-quantile graph. Three point seven is my value from my data set. So when you have you've done an experiment with nine values and these are the values that we got. So we take every value and map it to the corresponding z value in my normal curve. And then you get a plot like this. So the normality assumption, what it's saying is when you plot the sample quantiles versus theoretical quantiles, the points should lie along the diagonal. So for the first one, they pretty much lie on the diagonal. For the second one, beyond a certain point, you see they go off of the diagonal. So. If the plotted points lie reasonably close to the diagonal line on the plot, then conclude that the normality assumption holds. There is no formula here. No, there is no formula. This is not in Zybox. This is just, I just wanted to let you know what are we talking about when we say quantile, quantile plot, just to give you an idea. If you're not getting the entire idea, that's fine as well, because Zybox doesn't go into the detail. But when I was reading this and I was wondering what are these quantile, quantile plots, so I did some research and I found it and I thought I should tell you. So what we do here is you take the bell curve and then you're dividing it into 10 equal parts. When you divide it into 10 equal parts, the first line falls at negative 1.28. So this is a standard normal curve. The center is going to be 0. And then the values extend to 3 and negative 3 to left and right. And all values in between are z values. OK, the independence assumption, we assume that the residuals are not dependent on any external factors like the time. So if we were to plot it against the time, it should be a random plot. But if you have a pattern like the second one, so the residual seems to vary with time. So then your independence assumption does not hold good. Yes, patterns are not good. To sum it up, any kind of pattern is not good. You want to have a completely random pattern there.
That's for the assumptions for the residuals. Yes. The correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient measures the strength of correlation between a predictor variable and a response variable. The population correlation coefficient is denoted by rho. So it looks like a p, but it's called rho. And the sample correlation coefficient is denoted by r. A positive correlation means as one increases, the other also increases. A negative correlation means as one increases, the other value decreases. So this coefficient, correlation coefficient, tells you how strongly your predictor and your response variables are correlated. How strong is their relationship? So if my x values are increasing and I have a corresponding rise in my y values, then I say they are strongly correlated. They could either rise or they could either fall. So sometimes as x values increase, y values might decrease. That's fine. As long as there is a relationship between the two, the correlation coefficient will have a value. And this value, if it is between 0 and 0 0.4, then we say it's it's weak. We say the strength of their relationship is weak. So the correlation is weak. If it is between 0.4 and 0.8, we say it's moderate. And between after 0.8, we say it's strong. And the maximum value that you can have is 1. So in Python, we can create what's called a correlation matrix. If I import pandas as pd, then I have scores equals pd.read underscore csv. So all the data from the file exam scores.csv will be saved in the variable scores. You mean these values, the r values between 0 and 0 0.4? So those are the values for the correlation coefficient. If you were to calculate the value at the bottom of the page, see this one, this matrix, I'm coming to that. <laughs> no problem. I was coming to that. So if I do print scores exam1, comma exam2 dot core, C-O-R-R, -R, that's a function, then I will get a matrix like this. What we are trying to study here is exam1 and exam2. Are they correlated? Is there a linear relationship between these two? If so, how strong is their relationship? So that's what we are studying here. And that's what your correlation coefficient will tell you. So this set of code, when you run it, this is the output that you get. It's in the form of a table. We call it a matrix. So you have exam 1 and 2 in the columns and also in the rows. So whenever you have the row and the column to be the same value, like exam 1 and exam 1, you see the value is 1. And again, for exam 2 and exam 2 in the matrix, the corresponding value is 1. So, which is expected because exam 1 is strongly correlated to exam 1. Right? It's the same set of values that you're comparing, so they're strongly correlated, so the value is 1. But between exam 1 and exam 2, if you see, you get 0 0.07. So they are they are kind of moderately correlated. So the relationship here is a linear relationship, and it's moderate. It's a positive linear relationship. When I say positive linear relationship, it means that as x values increase, my y values also increase. In other words, as exam 1's uh, values increase, my exam 2 values also increase. So in your matrix, your diagonal values will be 1 on one side, and the other diagonal values will be the same, but it will not be 1. So exam 1 and exam 2, it's 0 0.07. And again, exam 2 and exam 1, it's again 0 0.07, because it's the same set of values that we're comparing. Sorry, it's 0 0.07. It's, it's very, very weak. I'm really sorry. 
I read it as 0.7 for some reason. So 0 0.07 is a very, very weak um, correlation between the two. So you can do this for more values. I think Zybooks gives you another example where you have for all the four exams. It, it's a bigger matrix, but again, the idea is the same. For the same exam values, one diagonal will have just values one. And for the remaining pairs, you will see the same values in the along the diagonals, but they will not be one. So the, it's just a number, but if I were to talk about a percentage, I would say 7.8% is their strength of um, their correlation. I could st talk about the percentage as well. Okay, the next is the t-test for the population correlation coefficient. This test is performed to check if there is a correlation or association between two variables. So we set the null and alternate hypothesis. So null hypothesis is that there is no correlation between the two variables. So my rho is equal to zero. My alternate, depending upon the question, could be either greater than zero, less than zero, or not equal to zero. Let me note the significance level, find the test statistic. Then we find the p-value, compare the p to alpha. So the basic steps are the same, like hypothesis testing, the one sample and the two sample. Then you determine whether to reject or not reject the null, and then you conclude. So here the test statistic is t equals r square root of n minus 2 over square root of 1 minus r squared. n is the number of values in a sample. So to find the correlation coefficient using Python, we do we import pandas as PD, then you import skypy.stats as ST, then you have scores equals pd.read underscore csv, and then st dot Pearson R scores exam one, scores exam four. That gives you the correlation coefficient. And also, it also gives you the p-value, but if you're going to look, be looking at only the correlation coefficient, I'm sorry, it gives you a t-statistic and the correlation coefficient. I'm really sorry. Here, the first value is a t-statistic. The second one is the correlation coefficient. So there are two ways of doing it. You can either do the matrix or you can use uh, the Pearson code. Next is coefficient of determination. So the coefficient of determination is denoted by R squared. It gives the ratio of the variance in the response variable explained by the predictor variable. Conceptually, the coefficient of determination gives the percentage of data that is closest to the regression line. The farther the actual points are from the regression line, the less useful the line actually is in predicting the value of the response variable. So my coefficient of determination is R squared. And it's given by the explained variance over the total experience. Variance, sorry, <laughs> I'm blabbering. So, what is the explained variation? So, if you see the graph, we have some data points which are marked in orange. 
Then you have your regression um, errors, which are the red vertical lines. Then you have a horizontal line, which is marked as Y bar, which is the mean of all the Y values. By mean, I mean the average value. So your explained deviation or the explained variation is the distance from the point on the line to the horizontal line, which is the mean of all the Y values. So that's the explained deviation. So you would do that for every, every point on the line. So you take every point on the line, find the distance from that point to the horizontal line, and then you have to square it. Then take next set of points, find the distance to the horizontal line squared. You do that for all the points. So that would be the numerator. Denominator is the total variance. Total variance is the distance from the actual point to the horizontal line. So that's the total variance. So you find the distance and square it for every data point. That would be the total variance. And if you divide the two, we get the coefficient of determination. So what we're trying to do here is when you find R squared for any set of variables, we are, what we're trying to find is how good are my predictor values helpful in predicting the value of y? How useful are my x values in predicting my y values? That is your coefficient of determination. And how do we find the coefficient of determination? We import the pandas SPD from statsmodel.formula.api, you import OLS. Then we do scores equals pd.read underscore CSV. Then we do results equals OLS. That's a function that will take on your predictor and the response variable. So exam 4 and exam 1 are the two values we're trying to compare here. This gray box, yes, I will. We don't need all the numbers. Some of them don't make sense to me as well. But we will look at the ones that are important to us. So I will explain those to you. So when you do OLS and then data equals scores dot fit, and then you do print results dot summary. So when you get an output, your R squared value is here. This is the value that we are most concerned about right now. 0 0.068. <laughs> so the other sets of values that we'll be looking at from now on will be the intercept and exam one values. So it will be these values that we'll be looking at, the standard error, and also the confidence intervals. Those would also be helpful to see. So we will be doing, I think in the next part, I will tell you what these mean. When we want to use this, they're used when you want to find, um, I think you do it when you're finding the, the residual, the mean, sorry, the regression mean squares. I forgot. I'm blanking out. So we'll get there. When we get there, I will tell you what it is. So we'll be using this. So basically, this section of your output is what we'll be using, especially the first two columns. And of course, the R squared value. Another way of finding R squared from the ANOVA table. So analysis of variance. Earlier on in this course, there was a part where we did analysis of variance where we did hypothesis testing using ANOVA, using an analysis of variance when we had more than two samples. But in, right now in this course, that part is not there. 
but we can still use the ANOVA table. The ANOVA table is nothing but it's called the analysis of variance where you're comparing the variance of two variables. So the ANOVA table looks something like this. You will have your explained variance and your total variance values there. When you divide them by two, by divide one over the other, then you get your R squared. So the first one, exam one, 217.166, that's your explained variance. The next one is the residual. Residual is nothing but your residual errors in your graph. So when you're talking about your total variance, it's going to be from the point to the horizontal line, right? That would be your residual plus your exam one values. I have not found any cheat sheet um, that will cover all of these. So they're kind of scattered. If you Google them, you won't find all of them in one place. So as you read, if you can just make a note of it, I, I have found that really helpful. So here we have the math for the R squared, the explained variance over the total variance. You will find a lot of examples when you Google it, but you won't find the exact set of code. And some of them might be related to some experiments that are far more um, involved than what we are doing right now. So I would suggest just sticking with Zybooks and the code from Zybooks. Why is R squared important? Here, let's go back to the previous one where we were comparing exam one and exam four, right? What I'm trying to find here is how helpful are my exam one values in predicting the values of exam four. Can I use exam one to predict values in exam four? That's what I'm trying to find here. So how useful is one variable in helping me explain the values in the other variable that I have? R squared is the coefficient of determination. R is your correlation coefficient. So it's nine o'clock now and I think have a few more slides. So for those of you who cannot stay longer, if you can just enter your email address, I will send you the recording afterwards. If some of you want to stay, that's fine. Okay, I'll keep going and, um, and I will send all of you the recording. Okay, so the sample simple linear regression line is given by y hat equals b0 plus b1 of b1x. So b0 is the estimated simple linear regression y-intercept. So you can see that in the graph. It's the point on the y-axis. It's the point where your regression line meets your y-axis. b1 is the estimated simple linear regression slope the change in the fitted value of y per unit change in x. This is where I'll show you how to find the slope. So we have looked at this function before. 
So when you do ST dot linear regress, we find the linear um, regression lines values. So we get the slope and then the intercept. So these are the two values that we're concerned about right now. So the slope is 6 and the intercept is 3. So B0 is 3.99, which, which has been rounded up to 4. And then the slope is a 6. So how do they get the slope? So you pick two values for y. So here they found 38, 34, and 28. And you pick two values for x. The corresponding x values, 5 and 4. You divide one over the other. You divide the change in y with the change in x. And that would give you your slope, or b1. So whenever you want to find the slope of any line, you pick two points in that line, subtract the y values, subtract the corresponding x values, and then divide the change in y over the change in x. That will give you the slope. So testing the linear regression slope parameter. This we're testing if beta 1 equals 0. So beta 1 is your slope, right? If that's equal to 0, what would that mean? Can anyone tell me? It's a flat line, that's right. In other words, what it means is there is no change in y with the change in x. So x values are increasing and there is no change in y. It means that there is no linear relationship between x and y. So when beta 1 is 0, we say that there is no linear relationship between x and y. But what happens is we usually we cannot find beta 1 because it is the population's parameter. And we normally cannot find it when the population is large. So we usually stick with B1. And we assume that B1 is the best estimate for beta 1. So sometimes we might have a value for B1. But that will make us wonder that is this representing my beta 1. When if I say b1 has a value like 0 0.06, does this mean that beta 1 is also 0 0.06 or could beta 1 be equal to 0? So in order to test that, we do the current test that we're looking at. So this test is to see whether beta 1 is equal to 0 even if b1 is not equal to 0. So we're going to have some cutoff like the hypothesis testing. We have some cutoff. We'll compare some values of the cutoff and we'll see if we can say that beta 1 is 0, if we can say that there is no linear relationship. So the estimator B1 is a single number used to estimate beta 1. If beta 1 were equal to 0, then no linear relationship would exist between y and x. But sometimes B1 may not be 0. To find out whether beta 1 is 0, we perform the t-test. So the null hypothesis is beta 1 equals 0. The alternate would be that it is not 0. Test statistic here will be B1 over standard error of B1. And then we'll compare, we'll find the p-value, compare it to alpha. And then um, we make a decision. So here is an example. There are some problems in Zybooks, but they will use this output to find the values. So here we have the Python code. We have model equals smf.ols. So we're comparing values exam 4 and exam 2. And then when you do model.summary, 
we get the big output that we got before. So now the values that we are concerned with is the ones that I have circled, the B1, and then the standard error of B1. So to find the test statistic, you will divide the B1 value with the standard error of B1. So the rest of the procedure is the same, like hypothesis testing. You have the test statistic, then you have your p-value given, and then you just compare that with alpha, and then you make your decision. So another way of testing, you could still use the p-value just for um, your test. But if the question says find a test statistic, then you would have to use these. So another way of testing if beta 1 is equal to 0 is using the results of the ANOVA test. So here in this example, the teacher of, of a statistics class with 50 students believes that scores in first exam predict how well students do in the fourth exam. The ANOVA table where exam 4 is the response variable and exam 1 is the predictor variable is given below. So we have the results. What we have to do is find the regression mean squares and your residual mean squares. And then you divide them to get the F statistic. So Zybox shows you how to do that. So there is an example there that they have shown. So you find the F statistic. So far you've talked about the Z statistic, the T statistic, right? The F statistic is another type of statistic value. And the way you find it is you have the results of the ANOVA test. From there, you find two values, the MSR and then MSE. Divide them, and then you will get your F statistic value. And then the rest of the steps are the same. So here, MSR is your regression mean squares. That's equal to the regression sum of squares over P of 1. So what are these values? The sum of squares is the first column, first value, 207.166. You divide that by P minus 1. P is the number of variables, and I think you do 2 minus 1. So we have two variables here, exam 1 and exam 4, so we do 2 minus 1. Then you have your residual mean squares, which is residual sum of squares over n minus p. Here n is your sample size, and p is 2. Sorry, p is the regression parameters. So we have two regression parameters, so p is 2. So the residual sum of squares is the second value in the column, the 2963. Divide that by n minus p, which is nothing but the degrees of freedom. And then when, if you divide MSR over MSE, you would get the F statistic. And then the rest of the steps are explained in Zybox, which is the same as what we've done before. So the confidence intervals for regression parameters. A confidence interval for the slope is an interval around B1 that quantifies sampling uncertainty when B1 is used to estimate beta 1. 
So what happens is because we don't know beta 1, we are using B1 or the sample estimate to predict what beta 1 is. So sometimes there is, there could be some errors. So there is a lot of uncertainty. So what we do is instead of saying that, okay, B1 is this value, so this is the same as beta 1. Instead of saying that they both are the same, we create a confidence interval around B1 and then we estimate what beta 1 could be. So we say, okay, because B1 is this, beta 1 is going to be in the range, this number to this number. So here is an example. The exam scores data set is a record of four exam scores for 50 students. Y equals exam 4 is the response variable and X equals exam 2 is the predictor variable. The teacher believes that a linear relationship exists between exam 4 scores and exam 2 scores. Find the 99% confidence level for the slope. Use the partial output below. So here B1 is this value, so 0 0.178. Using this, you have to create your confidence interval. So here, my T critical value is 2.682. So for 99% um, confidence interval, you can look it up in the table. It's there in module 2. They give you a table with some values for T critical. So they give you for the 99% confidence level. So T critical is 2.682. The standard error is 0 0.077, which is from the output. So if you recollect from module 3, your critical value times your standard error would be your margin of error. So you multiply the two. That would be the margin of error. And then you add and subtract that from B1. That would give you the confidence interval. So here I have B1 value minus the critical um, value times the standard error, and then again B1 plus the margin of error, which is critical value times the standard error. So that will give you the 99% confidence level, or confidence interval. Any questions? I think I've come to the end. Yeah. So any questions? I can take your questions now. I know it will seem like a lot, but as I said in the beginning, just make sure you read it and take, make some notes, and then it will make sense. They, they give you different ways of testing B, beta, B, sorry, beta 1, and then they talk about confidence intervals, they talk about F-statistic, but you'll have to read it a few times and then it will make sense. Yeah, believe me, I've done a lot of reading. No problem. And if you have any questions, you can always schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me. We can go over whatever concepts you want, any help that you want. So I will see you guys next week then. Have a great Thanksgiving.